This week on CrossFeed. Do you pray for help? What about money? Or venereal disease? <laughs> but do you pray to Vladimir Putin? It may depend on the size of your brain. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News, our fifth anniversary episode. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church, North Ridgeville, Ohio. <laughs> Sorry. I'm Jim Butler, pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. This is our five-year anniversary, and I'm not getting any younger, so... um. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a reaction to that. Did you not read those in advance? <laughs> it's called dramatic emphasis. <laughs> well, it was really good. You see, folks, Dale's a straight man. I'm the funny guy. Okay, it, it's good to learn that now. If you haven't, but five years, I've been, you know, he's the one who gives in depth analysis, and I'm the one who makes the snarky comments. And gives the dramatic emphasis on the right words. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, he's the sophisticated guy who went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, and you know, I'm the guy who is in the hermetically sealed world of uh, Concordia College, Ann Arbor. So, yes, he's a cheesehead, and I'm a Royals fan. So, you know. So, so, I think so, on that note, we're going to move on today here. Um, let's talk about Vladimir Putin here, Dale. All right. This is kind of, this is really, some of our stories this week are pretty bizarre. Um, this is five years, folks. Our stories have been <laughs> bizarre for five years. So there's nothing new about that. You know, some of our earliest ones were the were the most bizarre, and I, I don't think there's there's a few in there that we've never topped. You know, like mm. the woman marrying the snake and stuff like that. We, we've never been able to top those, but uh, this one's up there. Yeah, we, our first one was on Dan Brown for the first first one. For those of you who don't remember, our first one was about Dan Brown and uh, 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 his uh, book. Uh, the Da Vinci Code, that was it, yep. So anyway, this is kind of strange. About a group of nuns who worship Vladimir Putin, um, or however you say his name, I say it with Putin. a nice, with, I say it with a nice Missouri accent there, Putin. <laughs> so anyway, um, and he, um, this woman out there, her name is Svalia Frola, and, uh, she is a nun, and, um, she believes God has revealed to her the uh, history of Vladimir here, that he was um, has been reincarnated several times. And one of his past reincarnations was St. Paul. And then he was also incarnated as uh, Prince Vladimir, who founded the Russian Orthodox Church. And now he's... Uh, uh, returned as Vlad too here. Yeah. And she said, the Lord has revealed this to me. Well, obviously that's not true. Because if he had been St. Paul in his first life, he would be Lutheran today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we run into the bigger problem that it was St. Paul that said that um, that is given a man to, to die once and then comes the judgment. So St. Paul... That was Hebrews. Paul didn't say that. No, Hebrews is so Pauline. <laughs> anyway, every time I, I hear a quote from Hebrews, I always think it's Paul. Because no. it, anyway, um, <clears throat> Fred Anchor thinks it was written by Priscilla. I've heard that. So that's that's. that's I actually that's, talked about that I, this morning in Bible class. Luther thinks it was written by Apollos. So, but anyway, be all that doesn't may. Uh, um, yeah, it's just kind of a weird group of nuns who worship Putin. I mean, so, um, I like the, the great, uh, 
It says, uh, dress from, in, from headdress to sandals and white robes. Uh, Mother Fotinia, as she's called now, um, preaches a mishmash of values from vegetarianism and anti-abortion to strict bans on modern medicine. Father Alexei, the village Russian Orthodox priest, shivered with disgust when asked about uh, Frolova and her followers. They are unpleasant neighbors. Their so-called faith is a nonsensical mix of orthodoxy, Catholicism, the occult, superstitions, and political prejudice. That's about the truth. Yeah, I mean, here's the problem. You can't believe that she's the reincarnation of these Christian people because Christians don't believe in reincarnation. That's really a problem there, yep. <laughs> um, I like his, uh, I like Putin's uh, spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov. I guess they asked him what he thought. Uh, uh, he, Putin, does not approve of that kind of admiration. Click. Let's <laughs> 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 say. That I mean, she says, I love Putin as our number one, our commander, the captain of our great ship, and he is worthy of our love. So I guess, um, you know, instead of Jesus, Savior, pilot me, it's Putin, pilot. <laughs> New York, whatever. <laughs> so uh, also important to note that she is a former convict, was jailed for fraud in 1996. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, I guess there's another great religious leader that said before he started a religion, if you want to get rich, start a religion. Oh, that's right. Well, she said her awakening came while she was behind bars. Um, and uh, uh, um, she just uh, uh, sought great comfort in it. And, I think uh, she was reading L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> Well, she's behind uh, bars. Something. I don't know. <laughs> but then she keeps a uh, portrait of Putin in her bedroom. I'm sure and he appreciates he that. Soul of, he has the soul of a czar. Now, I'm not sure that goes over real well in, in Russia to call him the czar. Yeah. Maybe the Obama administration, but, you know, not too well in the, you know. It was funny because this kind of reminded me of um, back during the um, – the the elections last time where there were those sort of ads or, or whatever videos that were going around um they were sort of painting obama as the antichrist <laughs> like oh well, here's this, this painting putin as christ <laughs> or saint paul anyway <laughs> putin as the one I, oh my goodness gracious uh, obviously, this is, you know, fruitcake study here, um, you know, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, how often have I heard uh, people, you know, I, you know, charismatics, I remember, you know, you say, God revealed this to me, or God told this to me, or God said to me, how do you say he didn't, you know, outside word and sacrament, you know, how can you say God didn't say this, um, you know, unless, you know, you always have to ask, is, is some new prophecy aligned with the word? And that's where Dale's saying, you know, it says, you know, we're given once to die. Um, and a few other things, you know, that, that obviously what she's saying here is, it's, it's just so off the wall. Uh, no Christian person could ever look at it and take it seriously. And surprise she does and surprise some of her followers do. Yeah. That was amazed me that these people get followers. You know, I get, people must be, you know, but again, I think it shows you how desperate people are for something. Hey, Harold Camping still has followers. That's right. Although, by the way, by the way, in case you haven't heard, the new date is October 21st now. You know, I guess they said, uh, 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 um, you know, it's like, well, well, Mr. Camping, he, Jesus didn't show up April 21st. Did I say April? I really meant October. <laughs> well, look, see, no, this is this is actually kind of interesting. So a little sidebar here, but we were talking about this last week and, and, mm -hmm. and it's been big in the news. So um, the, he said that that he did come. And judge. And so now the earth is judged. And so they don't need to warn people anymore because the judgment's already happened. All right? You just didn't know it. All right, does this yeah, sound familiar but, oh. to you? Somebody predicting Jesus coming and then saying, oh, well, he did come secretly and judged. Mm -hmm. All right? It's Jehovah's Witnesses. William Miller. He pulled a JW. Yeah, uh, that's what he did. 
<laughs> yeah, but you see, I would have said, well, that's good. But what about the earthquakes? You promised earthquakes. You know? yeah. yeah, well, you, you miscalculated know? that part. So, you know, oh, I mean, it was a spiritual judgment. Oh, okay. Did the earth move under your feet or something that night? You know? I don't know. He stayed in a motel with his wife that night. So, <laughs> Dear, did you feel the earth move? I don't know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so do you think this woman just has a small brain? Do you think followers have small brains? <laughs> All right. This is a really bizarre study um, from Duke University Medical Center. Found that um, mainline Protestants have larger brains than born again Christians, Roman Catholics, and the relig- religiously unaffiliated. All right. Um, so, this now their definition of born again Christian is. Uh, basically an evangelical who's had some sort of born again sort of awakening experience. Cause like we as Lutherans, you say born again, we could say you mean baptism. Um, but, uh, what they're talking about is to have some sort of experience, some, um, where, where you have this sort of, um, sort of sense of awakening or, or something like that. And, um, and so they're saying that, that, Mainline Protestants um, have bigger brains, and and I thought it was interesting. Bigger brains than also than the religiously unaffiliated. Right. Um, all the participants were fifty eight or older, um, and actually they were recruited for a study on the effects of depression on the elderly. And um, so, this, and this she this this woman Amy Owen, and she's uh, Doctor Amy Owen, who's doing a postdoctoral fellowship at Duke, um, kind of developed study. Yeah, I guess it, look correlating the brain size, and I guess over looking over the information that she the people gave in their initial interviews toward, about religion. Right. So, and and that answered a question for me too, because like, who would do a a, a study on brain size and religion? You know, well, that wasn't the point of the study. That was just a peripheral thing that right. that just happened to show up in the study. Right. So now this is um, this included two MRI measurements of the hippocampus region of the brain. Of are you ready for this, folks? Are you ready? Are you ready? Two hundred and sixty-eight adults. I know churches with more people in them than that. Yeah, and well, and it's a bunch of. Um, it's it's also a, a bunch of people of a certain age, um, all presumably living um, in the in you know North Carolina. Excuse me, North Carolina. So you know it's this is a it's hard to to say that this is really a, a representative sample. Although if they want to say that I probably have a bigger brain than my atheist friends, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Stephen Hawking, take that. <laughs> no heaven, no brain. <laughs> yeah. uh, moving on here, yeah, I don't know. Um, the research well, has said that it, it might have, have something to do with the stress of belonging to a minority group. Chronic stress floods the brain with hormones that over time may damage the hippocampus. But they said that uh, says sociologists aren't buying it because... Even, I mean, ask anybody. Evangelicals are they really a, a significant a, a minority? Yeah, forty <laughs> percent. I'd say they're pretty powerful. The, nobody really thinks of evangelicals as a minority. So, no, I I don't think I would call the say evangelical Christians are a minority. Um, you know, of course, anymore it's getting me so that everybody's a minority. So of some kind. Yeah. Um, yeah, of some kind, so I don't know, but, um, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, and I don't think evangelicals feel chronic stress either. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. So, yeah, according to Gallup poll, uh, 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 a true evangelicals are a minority. They're a sizable one, 40% in the U.S. population, according to Gallup, and not exactly a stressed out minority, especially in the South. <laughs> So. Yeah, they may have heart disease from all those deep-fried Twinkies and, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason. I don't know. <laughs> but is there is there still a brain in a severed head? Oh, that's a stretch. But 
<clears throat> All right. Hey, is... I'm sorry. You know, I brain head. You know, I'm trying to get somewhere. You're the one who came up with this weird thing. So, <laughs> a patron saint of genital disease. Okay. Would you just love to go down in history that way? <laughs> I think yeah. you're better off saint, worshiping. Yeah, and his name Saint Vitalis. And you know, I'm just like Saint Vitalis of Assisi. Yeah, you I know? guess it's better than Saint Viagra. So see, but, you know, not much. I, you know, this is like a sissy is home to Saint Francis, who's you know very well known, one of the the better known non biblical saints, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but the long comes Saint Vitalis, um, and he's an Italian Benedictine monk. I've never heard of this guy before for the 14th century. Well, that's he right. Neither to an Anglo Irish the... family. Uh, oh, oh no, his head belongs to an Anglo Irish family, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and he. Lived a immoral and licentious. Uh, he was very uh, immoral and licentious as a youth. It says, and um, so uh, uh, um, he 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 sowed his wild oats apparently, and um, then entered Benedictine monastery and uh, eventually left that and lived the rest of his life as a hermit. Uh, wearing only rags and shunning all material wealth, exception of a basket which he used to fetch water. Um, I sure hope the basket was waterproof. I was just thinking, dude, how about a bucket? (laughs) Yeah, you know. Just saying. And he died in 1370. The word of his holiness soon spread due to reports of numerous miracles performed on those with bladder and genital disorders. So somehow or another, his head wound up in in Ireland. Yeah, and <laughs> and it was it was uncovered in an outhouse, which makes sense if you know he's a patron saint of bladder problems. So you know, <laughs> so I like the auctioneers. I take these stories, folks. Dale does. Okay, so you know I. The, the auctioneer said, although he couldn't be certain it was the head of a saint, it's certainly ancient, and it's certainly the head of somebody. <laughs> so, no no certificate of authenticity or, or anything like that. It's just a severed head. And and no DNA test. No. So, um, you know, it, it says that they... Uh, the Holy Cross Monastery, a Benedictine order in um, in the area, did not even know who St. Vitalis was, and after an internet search, declined to comment further on the matter of his or anyone else's severed head. The head, holy or otherwise, <laughs> was valued between 800 and 1,200 euros. It's, right. uh, I, I did a calculation. It's uh, 1,143 to 1714 dollars american okay now i mean in all seriousness folks i i mean i mean reading this article i mean this guy's having a real good time whoever wrote this i mean he was just really snarky if there ever was one uh just reading it um so um yeah i said um the, the family who's selling it uh, I think an ancestor brought it from a grand tour of Europe in the 18th century. So, I mean, you know, you look at this and how did Christianity focusing on, you know, where the who did you know? Because here's who did the apostles pray to? They didn't pray to dead saints. There weren't any, right? Well, okay, there's the Old Testament saints. Okay, but they didn't pray to them. They prayed to Christ. Right? Who Maybe they prayed to themselves. <laughs> there you go. I kind of doubt it. Um, you know, who are we commanded to pray to? God. In fact, um, the what is it, in the Psalms, it says, you alone who hear prayers. So, right? And, and who did the people pray to for genital disease problems before this guy was running around? St. <laughs> <Saint> Jude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think about this. This is really weird stuff. Um, yeah, but I'm reminded, you know, that, you know, the, 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 the apostles, yeah, I mean, the, uh, 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 confessor said, uh, in Lutheran Confession said something about, yeah, it seems like, you know, there was a, a, pre, uh, a saint for every disease out there. 
and they talked about uh, being in one monastery, and uh, there is a uh, puppet of the Virgin Mary who would turn its head and, and, and nod or shake their head to different prayers. <laughs> yeah. This is the type of stuff, again, where religion gets a bad name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's just good. I mean, you know, this kind of thing makes, um, you, you compare this with like the, you know, Greek mythology, you know, they only had like a dozen gods plus a handful of like muses and nymphs and, you know, other sort and of. And all the demigods. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, so like they had, you know, like maybe a few dozen total, you know, right in the Roman Catholic church and they've got like thousands you know, and it, it's just like, well, just pray to God, you know. Jesus is our only mediator, intercessor, and it's just. I, I look at this stuff, and, and on the one hand, you look at it, it's like oh, this is just goofy, you know. Um, I mean, just imagine somebody sticking this, setting up this severed head in their house and praying to it. I, I'm thinking that the what my. My gut reaction when I, when I first read this story was that saying, <clears throat> "Hey, I have the severed head of the um, of the patron saint of venereal disease." Um, is not a very good pickup line. So, I, it's it, it. You know, it, you look at this and you go, "Okay, is this good or bad?" All right? What does it do to the cross? You know, it completely takes the focus off of it. And and right there is your problem. That's your biggest problem. Way beyond all the sort of goofiness of people carrying severed heads around. Not to mention that, how does this honor the a person and, and their life that their head is up for auction? You know? I mean, wow. Really? And, and, and if that's supposed to be, you know, you look at the... Um, Oh, well, this is a finger bone of the Apostle Paul or, you know, or something like that, you know, and, and, and pray to it and stuff like that. And like, really? I mean, I wouldn't want my body parts on display after I was dead unless it was in a medical school. Well, Luther very wonderfully, of course, reminded us of that. There were Jesus' 12 apostles, 25 of whom were buried in Germany, and... <laughs> uh you know, there's enough wood of the uh, from from the cross, enough splinters of the wood of the cross to be found to build an entire village. So, you know, I mean, you know, these guys, you know, um, the uh, uh, um, Arab people figured out very quickly they had a bunch of gullible Christians running around from the West, and they took advantage of it. You know, and by the way, I mean seriously, I mean we we laugh about that, but the, you know. They're still to this day antiquities dealers in, in the Middle East that will sell you things. Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes quite authentically, sometimes uh, quite illegally. Um, that's how we wound up with some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They went to wound up going to these antiquities dealers who sold them. Um, one of them, um, one of the most famous, went to uh, some um, sale, uh, some some guy who bought it for. Uh, 20, bought one of the Dead Sea Soul Scrolls for the incredible price of like $250 uh, hmm. from an antiquities dealer and kept it for a while. And then he decided to sell it. I think he sold it for one a quarter million dollars for it. And he advertised it in the Wall Street Journal. Hmm. Thought it would be a great thing. You know, maybe some seminary library would like it. Stuff's priceless. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, but you know, so I mean, so in a, in a way, the same thing still goes on today. Is what I'm trying to say, you know. Mm -hmm. But in those days, people were just much more gullible. Yeah, and I don't know if you're worshiping Vladimir Putin and the saint of genitals here. Then I think people are still pretty darn. Um, 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 Although I don't know. know. I I'm gullible, looking at, I don't know. Yeah, I'm looking at the cost of this, you know, of, of what they figure it's worth. And I'm thinking that you could get more than that on eBay. <laughs> eBay might have rules about selling, you know, body parts of dead people. Um, 
they're, they're kind of strict about some of that stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, you see some of the stuff that people buy on eBay and what they're willing to pay for it. That's a, quite the conversation piece. <laughs> kind of a macabre conversation piece. But, hey, I've seen people buy crazier stuff than that and pay more for it. So... Or, okay, so, I mean, we're praying to Putin, and we're praying to a severed head, and we're praying to whatever else people are are praying to out there, but what are they praying for? You still have your health. And uh, so the American Psychological Association decided they needed to uh, do a study, and so researchers from the West Virginia University and the University of Massachusetts. Now, they really shouldn't have anybody from UMass take part in this. Because, do you know what our nickname for UMass is? It's called Zoo Mass for a reason. Okay, <laughs> so I distrust anything from Zoo Mass, but although it is the University of Massachusetts Medical School, which is a pretty good medical school. It's, not, it's in Worcester, not out there in Hamhurst. So, you know, they have to deal with real things here because they're dealing with real bodies. So maybe this is a little bit more things. But anyway, uh, and it says that increasingly people are turning to prayer when it comes to health issues. Um, and they got a nice little picture of a Buddhist here praying. It says, a greater public awareness of Buddhist-based mindfulness practices can include prayerful meditation as a possible reason for the increase. Could be. Um, said adults in the United States prayed about their health 36% more in 2007 than they did uh, 10 years before. So numbers are a little bit old. Um, but it does show an increase. Um, <clears throat> or maybe it's just a bunch of narcissistic baby boomers figuring out, oh my God, I'm getting old. I better do something. <laughs> maybe I should pray. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. It would be interesting to see the... Um, the sex, um, drugs, and rock and roll sure did do it. Maybe something better. All right. Well, it says women were more likely to pray for their health than men. 56% of women um, compared to 40% of men. As were black Americans when compared to whites. 61% of blacks and 45% of whites. And people who exercise regularly were 25% less likely to pray about their health than those who did not exercise. Okay, well, I'm in the praying and exercising side, so. Okay. And adults with the highest incomes were 15% less likely to pray for their health than those with the lowest incomes. Uh, of course not, man. Me. The people who got money can afford good health insurance. They don't need to pray. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, now, I don't know about this, uh, the, the guy Steve Peoples at Mission Hill Church in Topeka. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he, he sees the power of prayer. He's part of MediShare, a Christian health sharing organization similar to insurance that accepts only Christians, um, who follow a specific Bible based lifestyle as members. Why do I get the idea that drinking wine is not one of those Bible based lifestyles? Even though it's something that is specifically mentioned in the Bible. All right. So does that mean that they don't eat pork? I don't know. Oh, my other, my other comment here. I just, I think this is great. Um, Shai Taub, a uh, Pittsburgh, excuse me, Pittsburgh-based rabbi who specializes in ministering to Jews with alcohol and drug addictions, says prayer is especially popular among addicts. When human power no longer works, we entertain the notion of letting God give it a whirl. <laughs> wow, what a deep theory there. I want you to let God give it a whirl. <laughs> he says other diseases, we keep throwing drugs and therapy at them to the bitter end. With the addict, when that stuff doesn't seem to work, we've learned to go straight to the source of all healing. But, you know, this is, um, well, for one... It's like, it's just the 12-step program, right? Right, right. Um, but if it's a 12-step program, if God, as I understand him, or it, or, or it, he, yeah. or she, or whatever, maybe so, I'll pray to the table. Well, you know, this guy's a rabbi, so um, depending on what kind of, it doesn't say what kind of Jew, um, 
<clears throat> but, uh, which, I mean, because there's a pretty drastic difference. But uh, this is one thing, though, that, that, uh, that I thought about as far as prayer goes. And, and it's this sort of, well, we tried everything else, so let's let God give it a whirl, you know. Um, and, and this thing, you know, so often you hear people say, well, all that's left to do is pray. All right. And it's sort of like, well, we tried everything else, so let's pray. Because what the heck? You know, we got Can't nothing hurt. to lose. Yeah. You know. It's like, all right, I think you're missing the point of prayer, right? Prayer should be the first thing that we do, you know, even if it's on the way to the hospital, you know, but, uh, but, but still we, we, we treat God as this sort of, well, you know, sort of like those, like people treat St. Jude, you know, he's the, he's the patron saint of the last resort. And, uh, so if you, um, you know, that, that's sort of what people do with God is they go, well, we tried everything else, so uh, we got nothing to lose. Well, like, that's, <clears throat> not only does God want us to be, you know, to go to him first, but because he's the one that can help us the most. Now, oftentimes he helps us by providing us doctors and medication and, you know, and counseling or, or whatever it is that we need, right? But, um... You know, it's therapy. Important. Lots of therapy in my yeah. in my case. So, you know, you 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 just have to look at at the God is the source of all good things, you know. And so to sort of treat God as this sort of like, well, what the heck? I'll roll the dice, you know. I mean, it's just a slap in the face to God. I'll let I'll give God a whirl here. I just love that. Although I think almost you know the way he says that it's it's really is that because um, then he talks about the source of all healing. It may he says this may be their attitude. I think I don't think he thinks it's that attitude. I think I don't think he I don't think he has that attitude. We'll just give God a whirl. Um, I think he thinks that's where these people are coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've tried everything else. Why don't I want to try for God now? But you know this this part about the um, you know the higher incomes and and all that kind of stuff. This is also um, I talked about this a little bit in my sermon this morning. Um, this is what we call the theology of the cross. That is through suffering that we're drawn closer to God. You know, one of the ways that that God communicates with us and says, "Hey, yo, over here," is through suffering. Um, and and we don't like that. And it's it's really not like good PR for Christians, you know, to to go well, yeah, suffering, yeah, you know, um, but at the same time, nobody's going to deny the reality of it. You know, we know that there's suffering there, and and what Christians can offer is is actually a meaning to it. Now, um, and and what I said this morning was that that sometimes we run into things that, um, where where we need to be humiliated or, or we need to, you know, to endure some great trial to, before we turn around and see God. But, um, but, you know, sometimes something happens like this week, uh, we had four trees fall down, uh, in, on our church property and it, it prevented since I live on the, um, on the property in the parsonage, um, we, we couldn't actually drive in, we couldn't park here. Um, and so we had a park at the restaurant down the street. And, uh, so I mean, because of that, it was, it was a real pain and, and it was expensive to get the trees removed and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, thankfully there wasn't a lot of, uh, really any, any noteworthy structural damage. Um, and, um, and we're glad that we weren't home when it happened because that would have been pretty scary, but, you know, you go, well, what's the meaning of that? What, what is, what message is God sending us? Well, I don't know. I haven't figured out any meaning from that, but, but just the fact that, you know, while this just may be some sort of random because there were storms going through and, you know, our place is one of the places that got hit. We're thanking God that, um, that, that all, all the trees that fell, none of them landed on, like, say, our new roof that we just got finished, um, putting on. But, uh, you know, just the fact that we're looking for meaning and saying, is, is there some meaning to this? All right. God is the thing that gives, is, is the, the one who gives everything meaning. All right. And if it weren't for God being there and giving meaning to things, 
we would have no reason to look for meaning. All right? Just So just the fact that we look for the meaning, that God has programmed us to look for meaning in things, points to the fact that God is there. A very nice brain! So, um, so, yeah, you know, whether you're... Put it this way. Don't wait for your health to go bad. Talk to God. All right? He's there for you in the good times, too. And um, and he wants to be there for you, and he, he wants to be there with you, and to uh, he wants you to recognize him as the giver of all good gifts, not just the bringer of suffering. Yep. Well, let's finish this all up then. Uh, I guess we've been talking about some taboo subjects here, severed heads, genital disease. And that's the... Uh, Christians shatter taboos in talking about money. What planet is this guy from? Our Christians have been talking about money for years. Well, this is, he's specifically talking about a program called, uh, is it? Yeah. Lazarus. Lazarus and the Gate. Lazarus at the Gate. Lazarus okay. at the Gate. And it's a small group thing, and basically it, you know, you talk about where oh, I talk about this with people all the time. Uh, maybe I'm just weird, but you know, where, how much money you have and where does it go? And you know, they're, you know, so they're talking about Christian rhetoric and economic justice. And they said they, you know, um, this group, and this is in Beverly, Mass, uh, just uh, up on the North Shore, uh, not far from where uh, Gordon Conwell ordered my doctorate. I had a couple, um, uh, teachers who live down in Beverly. Anyway, they said in a, uh, um, you know, by the eighth meeting, which had been about roughly two months after this group started, they raised $1,800 for three nonprofits by cutting back on gourmet coffees, dining out, and other, um, non-essentials. Well, yeah, I mean, this is new. I mean, I've talked to people about that all the time. You know, when we look at, you know, where do we spend our money? And I, I mean, I even brought it up when I did my, um, did talk stewardship this year. And I said, you know, have you ever noticed that we can go out to eat into a movie and spend 50 bucks? We're going to spend 50 bucks just going out to eat and we won't think anything of it. But when it comes to spending, giving $50 to God, suddenly that, that, that $50 looks so huge. You know, mm -hmm. or, you know, I mean, we'll spend two hours watching a movie. But if the church service goes an hour and 15 minutes, that's too long. Yeah. So I think the difference here is that with this group, they're actually sort of, um, they're presenting to the group, this is our income in our budget. So there's this sort of like openness and accountability. Um, it's, it's not just, Hey, let's, let's talk about ways that we can save money and then, the money that we save that we use it to help our neighbor, um, which is, I mean, it's a great idea. Um, in, in this case, they actually say, all right, this is, this is our budget right here. You know, um, let's, let's, as a group, take a look at my budget and see where I can cut things, um, to give that to God or to give that to my neighbor and, and glorify God through that. And, uh, I mean, and that's a taboo. That that's sort of, you know, here's my 1040 or here's my budget or something like that. Um, that's that's not something you'll see in a small group. Now, some churches um, that are really big on tithing and, and sort of require it um, as opposed to encourage it um, are well. I, I you know, I've seen churches where you have to turn in your 1040. I mean, like the Mormons do that, but I've seen um, you know Christian churches. Uh, Baptists, non-denominationals, things like that, uh, evangelicals um, that do that. Not all um, evangelical churches, but some. Um, but here it's like a small group thing where you're getting together with your peers and and um, and and each person is sort of making themselves kind of vulnerable and and uh, saying, you know, what can I change? So, you know, there's a it's a great idea. There's a, a, a certain degree of um, of danger anytime you get into this sort of thing. And I'm not saying it's bad. It's, I'm just saying that if you're going to do something like this, there's something you got to watch out for. 
Um, and that is this idea that we're, you know, people could look over your thing and say, well, you're already given this much to this and, and you're not, you know, you, when you go out to eat, you get water instead of, um, instead of pop or alcohol or something like that. And, you know, and, and, uh, and you're, 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 you're tithing or you're giving beyond your tithe. Like, well, you're a good Christian. You're all set, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, people, cause I mean, the reality is, is, is that no matter how much we give, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, they talk about tithe. Jesus sort of upped the ante, and he said everything. <laughs> you know, what did I give to God? Everything. You know, Paul said, offer your, your bodies as a living sacrifice. And, you know, like, um, you know, it's like, you're, it, love your neighbor as yourself, you know. And even in the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You know, everything. You know, so um, you can never sort of be at that point where you go, well, I'm good, you know, check it off. So I saw a t-shirt somewhere. It was like Google images. I, I happened to see it or something like that. It said, uh, Christians don't sin. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm not one then. So I don't know. I mean, you know, it, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, that the, gosh, way back in the 1970s, Jim Wallace had his book, uh, Christians in an Affluent Society, you know, uh, 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 um, and, you know, talked about the golden calf. You know, I think this is a good thing. I mean, I think it is a, a good way for us to, people, Christians to really look at how they live. Uh, we do live in a very affluent society. And people will spend money on the darndest things and not even think about it. You know, um, you know, people will spend five dollars on, on, on coffee. I mean, you know, uh, they'll, you know, sp spend money on all kinds of things, um, and not really think about it. And I think we do need to have somebody, you know, lift us up and say, okay, how are you spending your money? Where is it going to? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, and um, I think then, you know, and it's just, it's just um, uh, college students are very interested in this and that it has attracted interest from a lot of non-Christians. Because yeah. they're also sitting going, hey, you know what? There might be something else that we can be doing. Uh, Help you, I can. Yes. Mm. So I think it's I think it's a you know not a bad thing for us to be thinking about. So yeah, you know, and, and this one uh, it's uh, from the Ecumenical Boston Faith and Justice Network, and uh, they present uh, Lazarus materials upon request with college student groups and churches. In other regions and countries, so any church that's interested in it, it's sort of a non-denominational uh, organization um, that you can get materials from them. And yeah, I, I don't see that it's something we're going to be starting up here. But uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really have bad things to say about it as long as your, you know, as long as your theology that you're working with is good. And and it kind of sounds like something you could sort of work within your main within your your framework. Um, and again, you just sort of have to avoid the sort of um, self-righteous tendency because we're sinners and we tend to go that way. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. So, so anyway, interesting stuff, interesting ways for us to think about it and things in our, in our lives. Um, but maybe I don't know, Dale. Maybe maybe you know you you and I should keep a taking a look. I mean, uh, I know uh, things changed in our lives when we started um, tithing. But I'm amazed. Just real. My wife and I were just talking about you know we're amazed how often we go to eat. It's just so easy to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, and and uh, I get to looking at it, you know ways that I spent money. It was, it was funny. I was reading about something about one guy and he talked about oh how much money he saved just not going out to Dunkin' Donuts for coffee anymore. And I'm like, 
I never go out to Dunkin' Donuts for coffee. You know. <laughs> That's been my problem with a lot of that stuff is where it's like, well, you know, uh, go to go to Starbucks once less. And I'm like, I never go to Starbucks. You know, I never right. pay that much for a cup of coffee. Yeah, I drink tea, but, you know, I, I, I do buy sort of gourmet-ish tea. There's flavored teas, but the cheapest place I could find them, you know. And I, I, right. I'll, the, I, the other hand, though, um, I often will stop off and buy a Coke and not think about it. Yeah, see, I, I buy tea and drink tea because it's cheaper than pop, even if pop in the can. And so I do it to save money. But, I, you know, I don't do it, so... Pop. I, yeah. Pop. Pop. Soda. Yeah. <laughs> or unless you're a true Bostonian, tonic. Yeah. Anyway. I don't want to use that word pop out here. Yeah, my brain's okay. not pickled by the, you know, ocean breezes. So, would you like um, soda or, yeah, would you like a tonic? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Good. There's some Coke out there. Of course, then you go down to Texas and everything's Coke. Would you like a Coke? Yeah. What flavor? What do you mean by flavor? <laughs> what? Do you want a root beer? Do you want an orange? Do you want a grape? No, I want a Coke. Yeah, but what flavor? Because that's, that's everything down there is Coke. It's just, I'm surprised Coca Cola hasn't sued for keep their thing. Hey, did we get any uh, email or any comments this week? I got nothing. That's, that's probably my fault. Hey, I had a folks, really busy we, week. We need email to read to you online. So please, please get it to us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. Or leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube or one of those other places. Um, just leave a comment there and, and, uh, also just want to remind people, uh, that this, if you are watching this on one of the video sharing sites, it is available as a podcast. Uh, I apologize that our, um, website, uh, crossfeednews.com is not, uh, there's, it's sort of malfunctioning and I've just been crazy busy at church and, um, and with family stuff and just haven't had a chance to, uh, basically need to rebuild it from scratch. Um, if, uh, if there's any web people out there that, uh, <laughs> people, no Drupal. yeah, it's a Drupal site. Yeah, no Drupal. So I, I can't Drupal. afford to, yeah, I mean, we don't make, make any money off of this. Um, and, but if, if somebody would like to sort of offer your aid to, to help us to rebuild it, you know, I can do it. I just don't have the time. So, uh, appreciate that. Yeah. One other thing, um, Two things. Number one, continue to pray for the people down on Joplin and also Sedalia, Missouri. Uh, not only do I know Joplin fairly well, but Sedalia I know extremely well. I uh, used to date a girl from Sedalia and I uh, used to uh, drive through there all the time going down to Lake of the Ozarks. So uh, it's just a little bit outside Concordia, Missouri, where, my, where I went to high school and where my mother grew up. So I'm kind of familiar with that area. Missouri State Fair is held in Sedalia, but... So I was very uh, upset to hear that they had a tornado through there. But continue to keep everybody down that area in your prayers. And tomorrow, um, nobody's going to see this, but I do pray that you have a joyous Memorial Day. But also remember those who gave so much that we could have the freedom to do this podcast and other things. Yeah, yeah. You know, and for that matter, um, to have the – we take freedom. You know, we, we talk good talk about freedom and, and, and that. But, you know, um, there's just – Put it this way. We've got a member, uh, of our church that I, I really can't go into the details of it. Um, because right now she's living in a country that's claims to be free, but really isn't. Um, and, uh, and, and, and if I say anything, uh, that could be traced back to her, uh, it could cause big problems for her. You know, and, and I, I talked to her this morning and, uh, via Skype and, and, uh, what just, you know, Wow, I am so thankful to live here. Uh, you know, and, and there's there's little things that we complain about. Uh and, and and some of them are big things, but man, we've got it so good here. You talk about giving money, you know, to places where it's needed and, and, and giving up little things. Man, we are so spoiled. Right. Well, our Iranians are all uh, applying for asylum here, so uh um and they and they deserve it. I mean, I'm just like man. They 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 need they need the uh, protection. They need 
the uh, protection that asylum will give. Yeah. Um, yeah you want to know whether you're there, they will be dead. Yeah. You want to know whether you live in a, in a good country or not? Are people trying to flee to it or from it? Yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, yeah, you're blessed. Take a moment. Thank God for your blessings. Now, of course, there's also people in some of those countries we're talking about uh, that watch this. I, I, I was looking at my uh, my sermons, the podcast downloads. Uh, China's the number one place where they um, where they're downloaded. Number two, Egypt. Uh, I mean, besides the United States. Um, so <laughs> I mentioned in my sermon, you know, I was talking about the availability of God's word here in the United States, and, and I said, you know, in some countries, they're so desperate for God's word. They even download my sermons and listen to them. I mean, whoa. <laughs> oh, by the way, you might as well. Let's, let's finish this up real quickly. But you asked a question on Facebook, which were the, after the United States, the two biggest countries that we got our downloads. I don't know if we got any uh, um, requ- an- uh, answers to that, but maybe you can give the real answer. Yep. And it is China, uh, which is number one. Again, besides the United States. And number two is Singapore. Singapore. Yep. So, um, you know, shout out to uh, all those in China and Singapore. Uh, I know, I don't know as much about Singapore, but I know that in China, boy, you probably get in trouble for listening or watching. Um, so, you know, you guys can count your blessings that you even have access um, to the word of God at all. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, uh, I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I pray for you all the time. And, and, uh, I just, my heart goes out to those that, that have to be careful about, um, about, about sharing their faith, about, you know, people finding out that they're Christians. Um, you know, for me, worst case scenario in certain situations, people go, oh, you're one of them you know, and, and sort of look at me with disdain just because they disagree with me. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm free to, um, to, to proclaim the gospel and, uh, and, and I don't have to worry about the government hunting me down for it. So God be with all of you and, um, and, and just remember that Jesus is Lord over there too. That's true. So God watch over, be with you, and keep you always. Good night, everybody. God bless.